So let's look at what drives the attention economy. Uh, Following our framework, we look at two sectors in specific, the, the social networks and e-business, which includes e-commerce, same as business includes commerce, right? Uh, commerce is a part of business. So let's look at how that then actually a mix of these two very prominent sectors of, of society right now are drawn in and, and dominate by the attention economy. That term actually comes from Herbert Simon, uh, one of the most recent polymaths that we had, an economist, political scientist, cognitive psychologist, uh, computer scientist. He won both the Nobel Prize in Economics and the Turing Award, which is kind of like the Nobel Prize uh, of computer science. And he used an analogy when he first talked about it back in the 70s, so that's from 1971. He said, well, there's only so much lettuce to go around and it will have to be allocated somehow among the rabbits. Similarly, in an information-rich world, the wealth of information means a dearth of something else, a scarcity of whatever it is that information consumes. What information consumes is rather obvious. It consumes attention of its recipients. Hence, a wealth of information creates a poverty of attention. And a need to allocate that attention efficiently among the overabundance of information sources that might consume it. So with this famous phrase, a wealth of information creates a poverty of attention, what he draws our attention to, pun intended, <laughs> is that that we have basically a bottleneck and that bottleneck is kind of like here. We can only pay attention to so much. So if there's an overabundance of information, the battle becomes of who gets you know, to, to, to be, uh, who gets to be the lucky one who can feed to your attention. And that's hence the term attention economy. We are competing, what we're competing over is the scarcity. And the scarcity is, in this case, the attention, which is limited by our biological evolution. We cannot pay attention to things we cannot, we cannot perceive. If you would be a bad for example, you could perceive different things. And if you would be an, an electrical eel in the ocean, you could perceive and pay attention to other things. But here, you know, we are biologically, uh, we have biologically evolved to be able to pay attention to some things. And that's the bottleneck. That's what we human beings are. And that's the scarce, scarce resource that the attention economy is competing about because what it produces is basically information. It makes predictions based on the data in order to provide you with more accurate information. And that's what they use in order to get your attention. Now, as I said, in the last decade, um, the digital paradigm got a lot of bad rap, while you know, previously we were very excited and now it got a lot of bad rap. So let's look at an example of how the competition for attention can lead to negative real-world effects. For example, in this study here, they show that emotion shapes the diffusion of moralized contents in social networks. So here on the, on the horizontal x-axis, I have the number of moral or moral emotional words that they detected. And on the vertical y-axis, I have the number of retweets. And you can see that, well, moral words stays pretty much, pretty much the same. But if there are more moral emotional words, the retweet rate goes up. Uh, and what they basically showed is that by adding a single moral emotional word to a tweet, increased its retweet by 19%. So we pay attention to something that's emotionally charged. So that's something that gets our attention. So add a lot of emotions to your moral judgment, you get a lot of attention. Um, then something similar counts here to, to critical posts, get more likes, get more comments, and get more shares than others. So here on the, on the horizontal x-axis, I have the number of comments, for example, or the number of likes and the number of shares. And on the vertical y-axis, I have, you know, how much disagreement there is. No disagreement, disagreement, and indignant disagreement. And you can see the, the number of comments, the, the number of, if it's more indignant, if there's a lot of disagreement, the number of comments go up. So they correlate positively. The X and Y axis correlates positively in that sense. So here again, the more critical we are, which obviously is emotion, if I disagree, I get, I get more attention. So it becomes now pretty clear that actually the battle of attention can have some 
may be unattended negative real-world side effects. Uh, to say it in the words of E.O. Wilson, the father of uh, social ecology, he says, well, one of the biggest problems that we're actually having is that we got paleolithic emotions, medieval institutions, and godlike technology. So our main information processor, this here, is, is basically you know, still the same as in the Paleolithic times. We share a lot of our, uh, of our information processing basically also with animals. Uh, if you think about, again, the bird that kind of like, you know, picks on a corn and then looks around. If you have a bird, if you ever saw a bird in a cage in a living room, the bird does the same thing, right? It, it sits in the cage and then it picks a corn and then it looks around if it might get, I mean, the bird is in a cage in a living room. So these emotions that the bird is having, this fear that the bird is having is still paleolithic. And we have a lot of that. It's not necessary that we have some of them nowadays, but we still have these paleolithic emotions with us, right? Then we have these medieval institutions that don't really know what to do with it because in, 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 institutions also evolve slow and technology just evolves exponentially fast. So that has out evolved the rest. And, and then these technology can start to manipulate our paleolithic emotions and play around with these medieval institutions. And that's one of the problems how these negative side effects that we right now that the digital age gets a lot of bad rap about came about. So previously, you know, we were all waiting for the singularity. We'll talk more about that, but what is that actually, the singularity? The technological singularity was always this prediction when digital technology will overcome the best of our abilities, right? So there's the mach machine intelligence and it will overcome the point and it exponentially grows and it will out evolve us and the machines will be more intelligent than us, right? The terminators will come and if we're lucky, convert us into pets, right? As the Hollywood story goes, or into batteries as the matrix vision envisions, right? So, um, so uh, and, and, and we've been in this race for a long time. You always said, well, but the machines cannot do that or cannot do this. So a long time ago, this is, you know, over two decades ago, that was described as the last battle of humanity. Kasparov played chess against an IBM supercomputer called Deep Blue. That was in 1997 when Kasparov went on. And that, that last battle, we sent our best one, our best chess player against it, and Kasparov lost. All right, so it seems like chess is not what r humans are really good at. Strategic reasoning uh, in a limited space is probably not what humans are good at. By the way, now um, computer, supercomputers even won against Go, which is a much more complicated game where you cannot use brute force in order to calculate a strategy. You need to use something like intuition. Right, because there's so many possibilities that it's impossible to compute them all brute force. Back then, it was still brute force computation. So strategic game playing doesn't seem to be the right thing. Then we said like, okay, so, um, but you know, people are still better in, 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 in seeing, in recognizing images, but images is something very qualitative. Machines, they can only count. M machines cannot like interpret an image. Well, in 2015, then that came about, the deep learning network surpassed human performance in recognizing imaging and interpreting imaging. Then in 2016, it, it surpassed human speech, conversational speech recognition. So we always said like, yo, but the human language is very unique. Only we can do that. Well, then it surpassed that. Then we said, okay, okay, the human face. You know, I only can really recognize the face of my family. I can really read faces. I can recognize them. And faces, that's something really qualitative. This quantitative computers cannot. And you know, 2017, the surpassed human level performance in, in person uh, identification and face recognition. So all of these things are crumbling. And we've been on this career for decades now, trying to see like, okay, so when is the machine overtaking the best of us, the most unique of us? It's, we're writing these papers and throwing them away in this race towards the technological singularity. What we completely lost sight of in the meantime, as the, 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 the folks from the, the Center of Humane Technology in, here in the Bay Area don't get tired to point out, is that in the meantime, the machine intelligence and the digital technology overcame our weaknesses. And that happened quite some time ago. So while we were looking for it to overcome our, our, the best of us, it overcame the worst of us. Now it turns out in order to get your attention in the attention economy, now, it's enough that I focus on your weak spots, on your vulnerabilities, and I exploit these vulnerabilities in order to get 
your attention. And machines certainly, we know for sure, certainly have come to the point that they can do that. So let's look a little bit deeper into this, into this relation between how attention can get Neg can create negative real-world side effects. And it not only does, as I said, technology is never only deterministic, uh, but that's what we're looking uh, at here, some negative side effects. So in the, in the game for attention, it can distract you a lot. About seven in 10 parents say the teen is distracted by their cell phone during conversations. We mentioned that before, at least sometimes. But half of teens <laughs> say the same about their parents. Right? So it's actually a very sad state of affairs that if parents want to talk to their children or children want to talk to their parents, which is certainly very important in order to have you know, a, a coherent outlook on the world, both of them feel like you know, they're both distracted on their phone. So how come that they are so distracted? Well, because there's an entire economy competing for their attention. And this economy, these applications, they are more successful in getting your attention than even a conversation with your parents. So then this distraction, uh, I surely have your, your attention, I can keep your distraction if I at the end make you addicted to it, right? Then if I make you addicted to these kind of distractions, I'm sure I'm having your attention all the time. So there have been long time efforts and there's this famous laboratory uh, of Stanford, the Stanford Persuasive Technology Laboratory from the 1990s, um, and which, which basically focused on that. How can you use technology, and there are other examples as well, how can you use technology to persuade people to actually get them, get a message across. And many People have been formed and, and, and have been trained in that lab, the founders of Instagram, for example. Same as some ethicists like Tristan Harris, uh, Silicon Valley ethicists nowadays have been trained. You can see if you go to their webpage, I invite you to go there, you can see how often the word ethical <laughs> and ethics is now on the description of what they used to do. 20 years back, right? It's very ethical. Well, that's, that's what the web page looks, looks nowadays. And, and, and these books have been written uh, many, many years ago, persuasive technology, and there are different models of basically how I can get your attention. Now I completely have your attention once I get you addicted. Because that's kind of like that's kind of like the main goal. Now it starts. It doesn't start out like that. It, I can also use it for the good. So the the intention, of course, at the beginning is that these distractions, as I try to dis distract you, and I try to get your attention, in order to nudge you to something more positive. As I say, technology is not good nor bad. It doesn't necessarily have to make you addicted. I can also develop a useful habit. Well, if you have this habit, then basically, you know, you're addicted to this new habit. That's actually, it's, it, psychologically, it's a very similar process. So I actually make that you naturally always fall to this positive, positive behavior. So I want you to recycle. I want you to do other things. I want you to be healthy. I want you to eat a healthy diet. So there's this famous book written, written about nudging from Tala and Sunstein. And Tala won the Nobel Prize in economics about that. So basically, it's about how I can nudge you, how I can use these digital technology in order to nudge you. I can put this one button up and this one button below and you can actually study then how I can actually achieve an effect on a voting ballot as well. If I put this option up or this option down, if I make the words longer or shorter, you can nudge people into desirable behavior. Well, what's the desirable behavior here? The desirable behavior here is to get your attention. So I can nudge you also to always kind of like be you know, in line with this, with this information flow. And at the end, as I said, you reached your goal. Persuasive technology reached its goal when it made you addictive to it. Then it can persuade you all the time. It persuaded you to stick to itself, to give it its attention. And there's been several books written. This has been a bestseller around here in Silicon Valley in 2014. It's called Hook. Um, a book that uh, this uh, the author Neil Neil Ayer he also studied close to the Silicon Valley Silicon Valley Persuasive Technology Group and he basically in this book lays out a recipe to make you addicted to get you hooked to social media. But a few years later, five years later, and a few heartfelt conversation with his daughter later, he wrote another book, the antithesis called Indestructible of how not to get hooked. It's, it's a full employment theorem if you, if you kind of like follow this advice, right? First how to get you hooked and then how to get you unhooked. Well, good for him. You know, he, he shows both sides, which also shows once more. Technology itself is not deterministic. Uh, technology is just a tool that we then humans can use.
So how then, how does this kind of like addictive cycle then, uh, addiction then lead to some negative real world effects again? And here we close the entire cycle from attention, distraction, uh, addiction to negative real world effects. For example, there are some studies that show that people that have a lot of social anxiety, this group of people, they tend to be attracted to online interactions. For example, if they look for a mate, they tend to go to more likely to online dating apps. For example, instead of you know, going out, going to a bar, hanging out with friends, because they have social anxiety, so they are drawn to that. Then, combined with loneliness, that results in compulsive use. So there's a lot of, there comes the addiction, a lot of uh, compulsive use of these dating apps in that case, which is then highly correlated with negative outcomes in the real world. For example, in work, right, once you have compulsive use of a dating app, that might have some real world effects on your work performance, on your study performance, on your family, on your friends and so forth, because you basically get addicted. And, and these negative real world outcomes, you kind of like, you know, you hit against reality with your addiction, then leads to actually more social anxiety, which then leads you to prefer online. And here we have the perfect vicious circle, right? So social anxiety feeds social anxiety. So where does that come from? Well, it comes basically from trying to get your attention, right? As this is what these technologies, persuasive technologies, are, uh, are designed to. That's where the compulsive use comes from. Because if you use it compulsively, I can be sure that you spend a lot of time on my platform. I do have your attention. And that's what makes the money in the attention economy, right? Every additional second you spend on that platform is money. That's what it is. Because the more time you spend, the more digital footprints you leave behind, the more I can study your behavior, the better I know you, the more I can at the end also sell things to you and predict you and sell your behavior to others and so forth. So that's the crux of it, getting you more time on it. And with that, if you're addicted, you're, you're the most, you cannot even leave it. Now, that hasn't gone unnoticed in Silicon Valley and some engineers that previously worked in these companies and also started some movement, one of the big movements that by Tristan Harris uh, that I already mentioned, uh, an ethicist in Silicon Valley, he worked previously for Google and he started this movement called Time Well Spent. He basically, starting from inside Google, started to argue that we should more like control, we should fight this addiction. These, these technologies are based basically, they're like, they're like casino slot machines, they're designed to make you addictive. Uh, addicted, addicted, right? So they're addictive machines. So that's what their design purpose are because then they get your attention. And what he basically said, we have to control that. And Silicon Valley was very quick to jump on that train and they developed all of these different apps where you can actually monitor your screen time. You probably, maybe you have one of them and you can look at your screen time. And, you know, in the early years after that, this discussion started around 2018 or 19, like always like a few years later, uh, a quarter of especially young people already use some kind of screen time monitoring tool that can tell you when you watch YouTube and you again get sucked into one of these black holes where you only wanted to watch one video but then you know an hour and a half later you kind of like wake up well what happened well this technology made you persuaded you to keep on watching the recommended uh, recommendation algorithm from YouTube sucked you in so after some time actually you know what the name is of the YouTube recommender engine, that engine that drives 70% of YouTube's views by recommending you what to watch next. The name is Watch Time Optimization Algorithm. That's the official name <laughs> of that algorithm. So it optimizes your watch time. It keeps you constantly engaged. So this is, that's also like the next video is playing automatically. The bottomless scroll on social media where you can scroll bottom, it's like a slot machine. You don't stop, you don't stop. It always keeps on going. It knows you, so it recommends the next best thing. So these time well spent apps then basically say, well, after 35 minutes, you can program that, you know, realize that you take a breath right now and you spend 35 minutes on YouTube. And then you can decide if you want to spend your time more wisely. And that's also then what critics actually say. It is an addiction. So that the fact that these technology companies now are providing these kind of like time well spent screen monitoring apps, it's kind of like a tobacco company that tells an addicted brain in the morning, well, you know, with our new app, you are in charge how much you want to smoke and when. So first they sell you, they sell you cigarettes and then they say, well, in the morning you wake up and you really feel horrible because you smell like 
why don't you put in your phone how many cigarettes you want to smoke tonight after a hard day of working and studying? Yeah, right. Let's see how that goes. Right. <laughs> so, so it's it's kind of like it's 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 a patch. It's it's a it's a fix. That's actually so many critics say it does not go to the core of the problem. The core of the problem that is that persuasive technology are designed to get your attention, and they really well get your attention once they have you addicted because then you cannot take your attention off them.